My name is Arthur Doler, or Art. Um, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, which is where I will be going back tomorrow, assuming that the snowstorm that's happening doesn't stop me. But it's Nebraska. We're used to snow. I mean, so is Ohio. Usually you guys get a snowstorm during Code Mash. All right. Let's get started. So we've got a lot of ground to cover today. I'm here to talk today about burnout. It's, uh, it's been a hell of a couple of years, hasn't it? <laughs> We've undergone the rapid addition of an immense number of new sources of stress. We've had to learn to do our jobs in new and in different and challenging ways. And at the same time, we've lost of all of our support networks and coping strategies for dealing with stress. We've had to deal with the constant threat of illness or even death. You may have seen this floating around Twitter or TikTok recently. This is a TikTok video of an art installation from the Guggenheim of this robot that this liquid is constantly seeping out from its base and it has to like go find it visually and drag it back toward the base in the Sisyphean task. It's been doing this since 2016 and now it's all rusted and like noticeably slower than it was when it started. I'm just like, same robot, big 2022 energy, right? <laughs> More than 76% of people in this Harris poll reported really feeling burned out during the pandemic. 67% believe their burnout worsened during the pandemic. And it's even worse if you're a woman. 42% of women say they often are almost always burned out as compared to 32% from a year ago. The increase over 2020 was 3% higher in women than it was in men. But it's not just the pandemic. We've been burnt out for a while. 76% of employees, based on this Gallup poll from 2018, or 19 rather, talk and say they are almost, or at least sometimes, burned out on the job. But we have this conception of what burnout is, brought to us through the media and pop psychology and people talking about it that doesn't quite mesh with the reality of burnout. So let's talk about that narrative for a second. And to help us walk through that, I would like you to meet Brad. Brad is a principal engineer at Inatech. He's been really busy lately. He's working on the, with multiple teams to do this complete digital process transformation company-wide. He's kind of a jerk about it, but he's been working some pretty late hours, which is okay because his partner's been picking up time with the kids and preparing them from daycare and making all the meals. Now, he has had to skip a number of leg days at the gym, <laughs> but after some sweat, blood, and tears, he and his team finally get it done, and it's over, and everyone's really appreciative, and they love it. And he's exhausted, but he's taking his family to Florida for two weeks, and he's gonna come back rested and ready to hit the grind again and do amazing things. That's not, that's not what burnout is. That's how we talk about burnout. Like you can take a vacation and come back from it, but it's not that easy. And it doesn't come that easy. So what is burnout? Well, it's not a mental health diagnosis. It's not something a psychiatrist can diagnose you with. And it's not just an affective experience either. And by that, I mean it's not just an emotional one, although it obviously has a huge emotional component. And it's not just exhaustion or depression, although those things play a major role in the syndrome. Now I'm dancing around the question here, right? Or the answer to the question. Burnout is a, what's called a syndrome. A syndrome is a set of medical signs and symptoms which are often correlated with each other. It's basically a kind of bucket that you put this in and say, well, these are all kind of related. They're often associated with a particular disease or disorder, but not always. So burnout is a syndrome, okay? What are the signs and symptoms of burnout? Well, it really depends. There are an immense number of definitions of burnout, multiple definitions and symptom lists from various researchers over the years. In fact, some research don't even believe burnout actually exists. They think it's something called affective disorder, or they think it's just depression at work. The original concept of burnout in psychology was coined by Dr. Herbert Freudenberger in 1974 in a paper called Staff Burnout. And then he wrote this book with this amazing cover, which popularized the term. But the concept of burnout has been around since the 1960s. It actually arose from like, California's drug culture. 
We are gonna be talking today about occupational burnout, which is to say, burnout associated with your occupation. That is not the only kind of burnout. Arguably, it may not even be the most important. But it's the one we're gonna be talking about today because we're at a conference about our job, or at least notionally about our job, so that's what we're focusing on. Now, the World Health Organization has a definition of burnout that is a little austere, but fairly easy to understand. Burnout is a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It is characterized by three dimensions, feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental resistance from one, or distance from one's job, or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job, or a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. Burnout refers specifically to phenomena in the occupational context and should not be applied to describe experiences in other areas of life. The World Health, Defin or World Health Organization's definition is explicitly about occupational burnout. But what is it like to experience burnout, right? You can stare at definitions all day, but you don't know what it's like. Well, here's what it's like for me, or has been like for me. Burnout for me is this feeling like I am the only one who can accomplish something or the only thing standing between you know, success and failure. It's a feeling of just sheer unmitigated anxiety gnawing at my core. It's the feeling of pushing rocks up hills and having them roll back down on me. I've experienced burnout at multiple jobs, in multiple times, in specific cases, and sometimes just in general cases. It waxes and wanes with you know, what I am and what I'm doing in life. And that's true for everybody. It's, I'm not the only person, though, that has experienced burnout. And as part of this talk, I actually did a number of in-depth interviews with folks to kind of gather a bigger, a broader slice of what it is like to have burnout. And I talked with folks who repeatedly found themselves in the grips of burnout at job after job after job and situation after situation. I talked with people who found themselves juggling stress on multiple fronts, not just at work, but also at home, also in their relationships. I talked to people who were stuck on dead end projects, whether through weird office politics or just through the happenstance of you know, assignment, who didn't know or didn't believe that what they were doing was actually useful or meaningful in any sense. I talked to people who felt like they had to outperform their coworkers just to keep pace, just to keep up. I talked to people who were overworked to the point of physical symptoms. In fact, I talked to one person who experienced burnout so badly they were having seizures. Burnout is this phenomenally complex thing, and it's very personal. One thing that I did find that was super interesting is that everybody seems to find their own level of burnout. You basically make your own little home there at some point, where it's you hit a level and you just kind of stay there, not really getting worse, not really getting better. In a little bit, we'll talk about the progression of burnout and what it looks like. But it's important to realize, again, that burnout is very personal. And how you experience it and what it's like for you isn't going to be the same as what somebody else is experiencing at all. Burnout was initially started to be measured by this thing called the Maslach Burnout Inventory, or the MBI. It's still kind of the gold standard for burnout measurement today. In fact, the World Health Organization definition is almost direct, directly derived from the MBI itself. The MBI measures burnout on three categories by asking questions and saying, or posing statements and asking, do you agree with this? You know, the standard Likert scale, how much do you agree with this statement? The first of those metrics is emotional exhaustion. They ask things like, I feel used up at the end of the workday, or I feel fatigued when I have to get up in the morning and have to face another day on the job, or I feel like I'm at the end of my rope. Another metric it uses is personal accomplishment. I have accomplished many worthwhile things on the job, or in my work, I deal with emotional problems very calmly, or I feel like I'm positively influencing others' lives through my work. Obviously, this one's negatively correlated with burnout, but it is a metric they use. In leader versions of the MBI, this is called professional efficacy. The third metric that it uses is called depersonalization. They post statements like, I've become more callous toward people since I took this job. Or I worry that this job is hardening me emotionally. Or I feel like I treat some clients or coworkers as if they were impersonal objects. 
In later versions of the MBI, this gets renamed to cynicism, but I prefer depersonalization because it's a more evocative term. The MBI paints this picture of burnout as this multifaceted experience that affects multiple ways of how you feel and how you live in the world. So how do you get there? How do you wind up with burnout? Well, with multiple definitions, there's plenty of ways to get there. But what we're gonna do in this talk is we're gonna walk through two different definitions, two different models of burnout. The first is Veninga and Spradley's 1984, excuse me, 1981, five stages of burnout, and then Freudenberger and North's 12 stages of burnout, which is from 1984. I'm gonna ask you to bear with me here because some of this is gonna get a little dark. The first stages of burnout for Veninga and Spradley is a phase called the honeymoon. For Freudenberger and North, they talk about the compulsion to prove and then intensity. The honeymoon for Veninga and Spradley is this phase when you've just started a new job or just started something new and you're working at it and everything is going great. It's characterized by high job satisfaction, by commitment, energy, creativity. In this stage though, Veninga and Spradley talk about it being critical, not because it's awesome, but because this is the stage where if you don't start laying down strategies for managing stress, you set yourself up for eventual failure. Freudenberger North, on the other hand, talk about coming into a job with a desire to prove yourself for whatever reason. And that can often be beneficial initially. You want to do good, you want, you know, if you switch jobs and you just got a raise, you want to justify the fact that you've gotten, you're, they're paying you a lot more money, right? It's when that desire to prove yourself becomes a compulsion to prove yourself that you start taking the first steps down the road toward burnout. You start to feel a nagging discomfort and you move into the stage called intensity. The compulsion becomes confused with conscientiousness. It becomes confused with dedication and commitment. There's a quote from uh, Women's Burnout, which is one of the books I used as a source for this talk from Freudenberger and North. And I love this quote so much, like this, it's amazing. I just had to include it. A surefire signal that intensity is an effect will be the unwillingness to delegate work responsibilities or domestic chores for the fear of losing perfect control. A lot of burnout as we walk through this, you'll notice that a lot of burnout is about making you do things that make the burnout worse. And this is one of them. In the next stage, Veninga and Spradley call it the balancing act. While Freudenberger and North talk about subtle deprivations and the dismissal of conflict and needs. For Veninga and Spradley, you've moved past the honeymoon stage and now you're into a stage where some days you handle stress noticeably better than others. But you start feeling some job dissatisfaction. You feel some work inefficiency, including avoiding making necessary decisions. Sometimes you lose things, either like in files or on your desk. And you start feeling general fatigue, having problems sleeping your mind unable to stop thinking about work. And you start seeing an increase in kind of escapist activities, you know, vegging out, playing video games, watching TV, eating, whatever your you know, escapism of choice is. Freudenberger and North talk about both chores and pleasures being put off until later. A waning attention to oneself is how they frame it, to your personal needs. These things you start pushing off in favor of doing more work. And when you start to notice this conflict or someone else says, hey, wait a minute, you're spending a lot more time on work, you actually double down on it. You turn around and say, yeah, but I've just got to get this thing done. It'll be fine. You say things like, I know we're just bailing water on this project and not really solving the root problems, but we just have to make it past this next release. Or I don't really feel like I'm doing anything valuable at my job, but I know that's all gonna change as soon as I get this next promotion. At certain point, a genuine physical fatigue sets in, you can't get rested. And like in Vinning and Spradley, they talk about displacing stress onto false cures, onto those escapist activities. The next phase for Vinning and Spradley is called chronic symptoms. And for Freudenberger and North, they move through heightened denial, disengagement, and observable behavior changes. For Vinning and Spradley, all of the things you experienced in that stage two get worse. You have start having chronic exhaustion. You start feeling physical illness because, and this is super important, burnout is about stress. And it's about an inability to manage stress. And stress 
puts stress on your body, right? You get a cortisol in your body and when you're stressed, you get sick more easily. You start having other problems, things like ulcers, etc., And you start feeling anger and depression. In Freudenberger and North, you lose an ability to distinguish between what's essential and what's non-essential in your life. And most of your time starts to compress into the present. You sever relations with the past and with the future. In heightened denial, these subtle deprivations, the things that you were putting off before, grow. You start denying and dismissing your needs as a human being. You can lose the ability to tolerate ambiguity. And your thinking becomes rigid and inflexible. And you disengage. Cynicism sets in. Isolationism and, bu- isolationism and bitterness start to set in. You become disconnected from your own emotions. And you start to withdraw which is obviously noticeable to friends and family. You start drinking, smoking, or stop drinking and smoking, or eating so much. You start either you know, leaning heavier into those escapism things, or you start trying to take control of your life by being better. And you, just, you start severing those connections that you need as a human being to thrive. Veninga and Spradley, talk about crisis as the next step, while Freudenberger and North talk about depersonalization, emptiness, and depression. In Veninga and Spradley, all of the symptoms you've been experiencing all along become critical. Those physical symptoms increase or multiply or intensify in number. You start obsessing about work frustrations. Pessimism and self-doubt dominate your thinking at that point. And you develop an escapist mentality, fantasizing about winning the lottery and being able to quit your job, fantasizing about you know, quitting your job and going to live on a goat farm. Those are signs, in some cases, of burnout. For Freudenberger and North, they talk about depersonalization, this disconnect with yourself, with your own emotions, with your body, with your own priorities. You start to not actually be able to recognize yourself. And you stop seeing others especially people you work with or have conflicts with, as fully human. They become either obstacles in your way or people who always do things one way and you just need to control or manage them in certain ways. And an emptiness starts to overtake you. You feel hollow, drained, depleted. The last stage for Veninga and Spradley is enmeshment. And for Freudenberger North, it's total burnout exhaustion, which is a very evocative phrase. Enmeshment means that burnout is where you live now. This is now home. It's fully enmeshed with your life, with your mind. You're not even sure who you are without it. And you're more likely to be diagnosed with a physical or a mental actual issue than you are to be identified as a burnout case. For Freudenberger and North, this is a stage where you no longer care about yourself or others. There's just nothing left in your life. You're going through motions and eventually physical and mental exhaustion leave you at pretty severe risk. And at that point, your life is effectively meaningless, at least in your view. It's okay, deep breath. It's rough. I was reading through these symptoms and I'm like, some of them I'm seeing in myself and obviously not this, but you know, with going through interviews with folks and seeing people in these stages and it's really distressing (laughs) to think that other humans can suffer like that, you know? But I wanna be careful. Experiencing one or more of these symptoms doesn't mean you automatically have burnout, all right? Now, burnout isn't a diagnosis, we said that, but You know, so it's not like you can not, you know, you don't have to be diagnosed with it. If you identify somebody who's having it, then you probably do. But be careful and don't just say, oh, you know, I'm starting to feel a little depersonalized today. I must have burnout. If you have it, you probably know it because some of those descriptions probably hit you right here. I drew all of them and some of them I was just like, a little close to home. 
I also want to say that even if you don't experience that full cycle, you still have burnout, potentially. Even if you don't get all the way to enmeshment or you know, total burnout exhaustion, you might still have burnout. Like I said, everybody kind of finds their own level with this based on who they are. We'll talk a little bit about some of the other things that can affect the level you'll find with burnout later. But you know, what's your support structure in life? Do you have a partner that you can rely on like Brad did? Do you have coping mechanisms that you use to deal with stress? All of those things will help you find a level, you know, not quite sink so low in burnout. And that's important, right? Like, don't gatekeep other people just because they're not having the same level of burnout as you. They might have a better support structure. They might have other things that just are going for them, right? But the other way is true, or the other way around is true too. Don't judge somebody because they're experiencing worse burnout than you. Because maybe they don't have all the things you do, or they're grappling with more. So, Let's look at some intersections between burnout and various pieces, because burnout isn't just happening in your head. It's not like you just walk onto the job one day and decide to get burnt out, right? It's about intersections between you and other things, either your, your job and your personality, your, um, who you are as a person. All of those things can affect the levels of burnout that you'll experience. Let's talk about burnout in your personality. So how did you learn to handle stress? Were you lucky enough to have a family that taught you coping mechanisms? Did you learn them in school? Did you have to figure them out for yourself at some point? Did you stumble on them or did you read a book? All of these things, how you've managed stress is super important because burnout is about stress. Feeling stress from not just your job, but external things in your life that can affect the amount of burnout you're feeling. And so if you're good, better at managing your own stress levels, you're less likely to experience burnout. And if you do, you're less likely to hit those lower stages, the lower rungs on that ladder. I guess it's more lower like portions of the chute, but I'm digressing. Things like how you view yourself, your self image drastically affect burnout. If you have high self-esteem, if you view yourself as an achiever, as a driver, as somebody who goes out and does things, you could be at risk for burnout because you're putting yourself into this category where you demand more of yourself. But the opposite is also true. If you have low self-esteem, if you view yourself as not really that smart or intelligent, et cetera, not really that you know, good at what you do, that can also affect your burnout because you're more likely to feel like you have to push forward, you have to push harder than other people. How optimistic you are, your natural wiring, and how you view the world can also affect burnout. If you tend to view things and you're like, well, things will probably go okay, it's a lot easier to shrug off stress. And I envy the hell out of you. <laughs> right, but it's, these kind of things that just happen through happenstance of who you are as a person, your genetics, your upbringing, et cetera, all, can all affect the levels of burnout that you're feeling, the amount of experience that you have. But it's not just you. Occupational burnout is occupational burnout for a reason. It's about your job. And there are a number of things that could be about your job or the ways your job works that can drive burnout all on their own, regardless of who you are and what you're bringing to the table. For instance, and this is the classic one, a mismatch in workload. If you're being asked to achieve more than you can reasonably achieve or even possibly achieve, that's your classic kind of model of burnout, right? Of you're working all of these hours and grinding and trying to get these things done. That's a mismatch that can drive you into burnout because you have a mental, you realize that you have no way of achieving these things, no way of succeeding at this goal. But it can also be a mismatch of control. If you're being asked to achieve things that you have no ability to actually affect, if you are being asked to create outcomes that you can't feasibly do, that can also lead to burnout. 
Or it could be that you're not getting you know, appropriate rewards for your work. You're not being paid enough. You're not getting enough appreciation. You're feeling yourself as though you know, it, you're not getting enough out of the actual job itself. It could also be a loss of positive connections with others in the workplace. And I can't imagine anything that has happened in the last couple of years that would cause that to happen. <laughs> Zoom. Right? We all got shoved into our own homes, isolated and alone. No wonder that we started feeling burnt out. But it could also be that we feel unfairness a lack of fairness or resources. And it doesn't even have to be real. It just has to be perceived. If we're perceiving that somebody is valued more than us, receiving more than us for the same work, if we feel like we're not being allocated the resources to accomplish the tasks that we're being asked to do, that can also lead to burnout. And lastly, there could be a conflict between values. And I don't mean this in like a strict mathematical sense or even in really a money sense. What I mean is that if you are working at a company that doesn't necessarily care about things that you care about. Now that could be political, that could be ethical, that could be a you know, big capital B things, right? But it can also be smaller things. If you're working for a manager or a company, or just a process that you're putting out something where they care a lot more about shipping code constantly and it doesn't really matter as much if it's stable or great or amazing code, and you care a lot about crafting that perfect function. There's a disconnect in value there. And the things that you think are important are not what they think are important. And that can also lead to burnout because you feel like you're, again, not being valued. You feel like the things you are bringing to the table aren't actually worth anything in the environment in which you're working. Because burnout has multiple ways of affecting you at your job, because the structure of your job can cause burnout through multiple ways, it's important and extremely important to note this. You can get burnt out only working 40 hours a week. You can get burnt out working less than 40 hours a week. If you feel like you're going into work and shipping code and it doesn't matter and nobody cares and it's not worth anything, you're going to feel burnout. It doesn't matter if you're doing it as a 20 hour, you know, 20 hour a week job or doing it as a side gig. So this conception that we have that burnout has to be related to the amount you're working is completely false. And if you take one thing away from this talk, I want you to take that, is that you can absolutely come out with burnout regardless of what you're doing. But if you know me, you know that I like to talk about brains and mental health. So this was probably inevitable, right? We have to talk about how your mental health affects burnout. If you grapple with depression or anxiety on a regular basis, you are set up for burnout out of the gate, right? They're pulling the old like vaudeville prank on you more or less. You start off in the hole and it's more easy to put you in tilt and start you down the slide. If you happen to grapple with something mental where you have cycles of activity, regardless of what it is, you can create this, I have to get it done mentality whenever you hit your highs. And you start shoveling all of the work into those periods, which makes you feel even worse when you inevitably come back down to a low and can't get anything done. You're forcing yourself to get done and you start working more because you feel like you have to get more done and you're just exacerbating the problem. Repeated or severe cycles of burnout itself can actually start to cause a PTSD, maybe even in a diagnosable sense, but certainly in the sense of you start to feel some pretty strong emotions when you wind up back in a uh, situation you've been in before. I've been um, on projects, well, I had a job once, spent a year and a half doing ETL for an election company in Omaha. Uh, nightmare job, worst job of my life, drove me back into therapy, had panic attacks, it was terrible. 
uh, definitely had burnout alongside of all of that. Uh, I got placed on an ETL project at work a couple years ago, and I was like, we can take this. I was very wrong. <laughs> it's not even repeated patterns. I had it once, and I found myself in burnout, not instantly, but there was a pretty rapid and noticeable degradation. <sighs> Humans are pattern-solving machines, pattern-finding machines. And when we encounter patterns, when we encounter negative things, even if it's a pattern of one in some cases, if it's a strong enough stimulus, our stress can just spike unexpectedly when things hit too close to home. When we find ourselves in situations that are too similar, even if rationally we're like, these are two different things. I'm at different companies, different people. Brain don't care. It's like, that is the same shape as that, and I'm very upset about it now. <laughs> This one, the next one's a little tough to talk about because it's kind of a vicious circle. But if you grapple with mental health problems in your life or negative in you know, relationships, you can, you know, if, you're, if you feel like you're not in control in your life or in your home, you can often become a what's, you know, workaholic because work is often something you can control because largely, you know, especially as an individual contributor, the things that you are able to do are under your control. You know, you can ship a ticket, you can ship code, you can write something, that's doable. And so you can seek that control, that, that need for control in your work. And if you're doing that, you're setting yourself up to be worse off with burnout because you're forcing yourself to now work more and into those situations where you are, you know, ignoring things that you could be doing to make the rest of your life better. Or at the very least, addressing those issues. <sighs> Lastly, let's talk about burnout and like the whole of you, the big identity stuff, demographic stuff, et cetera, right? <sighs> if you feel the need to prove yourself that can start propelling you into the burnout sequence. Remember that Freudenberger and North talked about that compulsion to prove. If you start out as a POC or a woman in tech, I guarantee you, you are like already a step along because you feel like you've got to do more to make, you know, to even to measure up. And that, I guess if you start in the hole, you start with a negative. Additionally, if you deal with you know, implicit bias on a regular basis, whether that's through microaggressions or macroaggressions, any other number of things. If you're encountering those things that cause friction in daily life, that can preload your brain with stressors. Like your stress level starts higher already. Again, you start in the hole. Additionally, burnout can actually manifest differently depending on your gender. Research suggests that burnout Act, you know, for men, tends to have higher levels of depersonalization. But for women, it tends to have increased levels of emotional exhaustion. Now that's, we could argue all day about whether that's a question of the, amount, the types of work that women are typically asked to do, or whether it's cultural, et cetera. But the fact is that that's what they've de determined in terms of studies. In fact, it's different enough that I've been citing Freudenberger and North all along in 1984, Freudenberger and North wrote a book called Women's Burnout to talk about burnout and especially about the burnout from the emotional labor that women are often asked to take on in the home. Emotional and, you know, emotional and otherwise labor, right? So, we've talked a lot about burnout. How do we get out of it? <laughs> Everybody was like really hoping I would finally get to this part. <laughs> the rest of this is depressing, what can I do? Well, okay, let's start off with this. No amount of self-care is going to fix your burnout, okay? If you are burnt out, taking a vacation is not gonna cut it. Meditation is not gonna, can't, you meditate and do like pranayama breathing or box breathing, shut up. <laughs> It's not gonna, fit, like, it can slow, it can delay the onset of burnout because those things are often stress management tactics.
but it's not gonna fix it once you're there. The dumpster's on fire. You can't breathe your way out of that. If you're luckier than I am, you can take like a six to eight month sabbatical from your job and go to Greece or somewhere and recover. I'm not that cool. In and in fact, some of that might be strongly, like the actual experience itself might be strongly negative in the first case anyway. Freudenberger himself only started talking about burnout. Like he, he came up with the whole conception because he was a case of burnout first. He worked himself insane hours constantly, felt like he had to prove himself, like he had to do all of these things. His wife finally convinced him to go on a vacation to California. And the day comes, they're gonna get on the plane. Freudenberger can't get out of bed. Like he's just so exhausted and physically in pain because his body's like, finally, there's a break. <sighs> they had to cancel the vacation, obviously, but that was the moment where he's like, okay, I'm a doctor and something's wrong here. I don't know why it took him that long, but <laughs> you can't just, like I said, meditate your way out of this. The first step to coming out of burnout is to stop denying it. We have a tendency as humans to do what I call, or perform what I call facile optimism. We have this tendency to minimize our own emotional experiences because it helps us feel like we're in control of our own lives. This is the entire pandemic, basically. <laughs> Right? There's all of, the world is basically on fire outside the window and we're like, how are you today? Oh, it's Monday, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so, or, you know, are you sure you're not feeling burnout? Like you, you seem like you're exhausted and you're just frustrated all the time. Oh, it's not really burnout. I'm just, you know, it's a little bit of anxiety and the rest of it. Shut up, you're burnt out. If you have, to, you have to come to grips with it to be able to actually work your way out of it. And admitting it doesn't mean that you are a failure, okay? It just means that various things have locked together and pushed you down that path. And it doesn't mean that you're going to encounter it over and over and over again. Once you've sat down and stopped denying it, then there's another very important step. If you've been, I know we don't travel much anymore, if you've been lucky enough to take a plane flight in the past like 30, 40, 50 years at this point, you've probably seen this though, assuming you've pulled it out of the uh, safety back pocket and not just ignored the safety presentation. This is from a safety briefing card from an airplane. And this is this from the section where they talk about when the cabin pressure drops, oxygen masks will fall down from the ceilings. And there's this very important part where they talk about if you're traveling with a child or someone else who needs help, you put your own oxygen mask on first. And the reason you do that is because otherwise you will pass out and die and they will be fine. You put your oxygen mask on first and then you help others. People have taken this phrase and used it to talk about you do your own self-care first. I said self-care is not gonna fix your way out of this. It's not, but doing it is damn sure gonna help. Avoiding your own self-care isn't gonna help you at all. Find out what works for you whether that's meditation, exercise, yoga, I don't care, therapy, pick your own. There's a million things out there. There's a whole wellness culture that will sell you a bunch of different ways to recuperate. You have to find the thing that works for you. Not only is that going to help you stabilize, but it's going to help you next time you might fall into burnout. But again, this isn't a solution. So let's talk about actual solutions. The first way out is get a new job. Done, right? Talk over. Uh, no, this, <laughs> this seems like the obvious one, but it's not actually always the right option. Because, I mean, not just because of the sheer problematic aspects of, you know, some people can't find new jobs for various reasons, et cetera. It's not always an option for folks. And so what you have to do is look at your situation and you know, run back through those intersections that we talked about. How much of your burnout is coming from situations at your job and how much of it is things you're bringing to the table? Not that you're at fault for bringing those to the table, but just a realistic look and say, which of these things is true? If you're bringing a ton to the table, like if I went and got another ETL job, I'm now bringing two traumatic experiences to the table, it's probably not gonna go well for me. 
And if you get another piece of a job, again, you're just starting at that honeymoon stage. You have another chance to avoid burnout, but if you don't change how you deal with stress and how you engage with stress, because every job's stressful. They don't pay you because it's fantastic, right? You have to manage that stress somehow. If you don't, that's gonna start you marching down that path again. So finding a new job isn't always the right answer. But if you're looking at it and saying, nobody cares what I'm doing, and nobody cares if I'm here at all, find a new job. Find something worthwhile where you and others see the value in what it is you're doing. The MBI has an optional category called involvement where they measure people on. And it's about things like, how much good do you feel you're doing in the world? Do you think you're making a difference? That's the kind of thing you're looking for, ideally. Not everybody's gonna get those jobs. They don't, you know, a lot of jobs aren't that. Which is another reason that finding a new job may not be the solution. The second way out is work-life boundaries. Please don't get up. Please stay in your seats. <laughs> I promise you, I'll then tell you how to get some work-life boundaries. Because we throw around this phrase like it's easy, right? And it's not. Show of hands, how many people got into software because they liked coding? Right. It's not that easy to build these things when you enjoy doing the thing that you do on a regular basis. We come into this often at a net negative in terms of understanding who we are outside of our jobs. You have to find an identity that is not your job. Yeah, I promise you, you actually do. It will make you a better person. I went and I became a public speaker, which is not that much better, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you have to find something, right? Who are you? Are you a parent? Are you a spouse? Are you a board member in something? Are you a you know, clergy member in a church? Are you a member of some organization? Who are you? And what do you identify with? Not that forklift. <laughs> I have to say that it's probably the first time I've seen a forklift drive past one of the talks. <laughs> the other way, or another way, to help start building those work-life boundaries is to start thinking transactionally. Breaking your job down into transactions. What are you getting out of it? What are you willing to give to get that? Time, energy, love and care? Right? The, you have to come to your own agreement on this, your own decision. When I started programming, my first job when I moved to Omaha, um, I had a mentor who taught me one thing that I've always kind of kept in my back pocket because it's useful to pull it out sometimes and look at it. And what he said was, every paycheck, every two weeks, you and your employer are square. You owe each other nothing. And it's not that you hold that and you be mercantile about it, although that is one way to approach a job and make sure that you have firm boundaries. But if you do enjoy what you're doing and you enjoy your company, you enjoy your coworkers, it's not always the, the view that you wanna have, but it's useful to have that in your hip pocket to pull out and look at it sometimes and you're like, okay, I gotta remember, I don't, you know, your job's not gonna love you back. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. And your job is not worth giving up time with your family, with your friends, or with your partner, ever. Ever, okay? It just isn't. Jobs aren't worth that. Now, if you work with a bunch of your friends, that's a, you know, you see your friends at work, that's great. But also see your friends outside of work. Engage with them in ways that are not structured through your job. The third way out, which I briefly showed here, was seek involvement elsewhere. The fact that burnout can happen when you are not working 40 hours a week, or when you're only, or even less, right? There's this weird kind of corollary to it, which is sometimes you can get out of burnout by doing more. I talked about that MBI involvement thing, right? Start volunteering somewhere, find that involvement. If you can't leave your job, if you feel like it maybe wouldn't help, Go find some involvement elsewhere in your life. Go volunteer with something. 
And don't like go jump in and say, great, I'm gonna go be a board member and this will be at a nonprofit, this will be fantastic. Don't move into a place where you can't, there's, you know, something, you wanna find something where they aren't gonna miss you if you don't show up one day. Not that you're gonna ghost them necessarily, but if it's something comes up, you don't wanna be a pivotal part of that organization because you're just putting yourself back in that situation with potentially burning out. You want to do something like Habitat for Humanity, where you can go swing a hammer for a weekend and build a house for someone, right? You want to do something where you can put in some effort and work and really see that you're making a difference in the world. Now, this is a personal choice. Which of these routes you pick is entirely up to you. I can't tell you. Now, each of one of you has your own set of circumstances, whether you're experiencing burnout or not. Everybody's life is different and complex and wonderful and chaotic, right? And you have to make the choice as a result. I can't do it for you. You have to figure out what it's going to take to start working yourself out of burnout. But I want to urge you to give yourself time. Even if you can't take a sabbatical, even if you have to go find another job or start working and volunteering, take and give yourself the time to actually heal. Don't expect it to get better overnight. It's going to take a while for you to start coming back to yourself. Because you took a long time to journey away from yourself and it's gonna take a while to get back. It's not gonna go away in a couple weeks. It's not gonna go away in a couple months, potentially. So if you're lucky enough to work yourself out, or maybe you don't feel like you're experiencing burnout, how do you help others? How do you get other people out of burnout? Or at least help them heal? Well, here's what you can do as an individual. If you're just an individual member of your team or a family or friend, you can normalize talking about burnout. Not in a casual way per se, not just be like, man, I'm so burnt out after like working Oh, you know, it's Friday, I'm so burnt out after the week. Okay, whatever. Talk about it in terms of things like, I, you know, we've been making this push to get this release out and I'm really feeling it. Or, you know, I'm feeling all of this external stress from something in my life, right? Start normalizing talking about these things. Just doing it until, you know, your manager makes you stop. But <laughs> you can at least try to have those conversations. Another thing you can do is to knock down hero culture. Just destroy it. Don't destroy the heroes. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is knock down the system, the work processes that require heroes at your workplace. Build up team interdependence on each other. Instead of being and you know granting, um, I want to say fiefdoms, but you know turning around and, and knighting people who are heroes on, at work, giving them shout outs and laudatory things, don't do that. If you had to be a hero, it means something in your process actually failed. <laughs> Thank you. You can work towards doing this by building processes that share load instead of condensing load. And I don't just mean like your average work tickets. I mean things like taking notes at meetings, doing work to do breakdowns, interviewing clients. It doesn't really, you know, whatever your role is. But there are lots of things that often get shunted onto particular members of your team that they take up because they don't see anybody else doing it. Build explicit processes that help you share that load across the team. Not only is that going to make it better for everybody and you're going to experience less burnout, I promise you it will actually make you a better developer or a better whatever it is your job role if you understand more about how your actual team works. Help others see what they can't. Because of that stuff like facile optimism, often people don't see that they're experiencing burnout. And I mean, to the point where you, it's very obvious to you and it's, they're just not seeing it. If someone's often angry, inflexible in discussions, they just want to do it their way, and why can't you just see that? Now, some of that's personality, but sometimes that can be burnout. If they're not going home, if you log on at 6 in the morning to Slack and you see somebody active, you see them at 6 p.m., call them out on that. 
And you can discuss external stressors with folks. Talk about what's going on in your life, your sick cat, your parent who's having a, you know, cancer or being whatever. Your, I don't know, the sports ball didn't go right. <laughs> I was actually going to try and make a reference and I realized I don't even know what season is. <laughs> I think it's football, is that happening? <sighs> Talk about those external stressors, right? Even if it seems dumb, things that actually cause you stress outside your life affect your life. You can't leave that at the door of your work. It doesn't happen. If you're a manager, if you're a leader, you can do a couple more things. Build Slack into your schedules. And I mean that, like, don't just go, well, okay, here's comp time. Build actual slack into your schedules. If you are pushing with a team, a Finland teams that have accomplished amazing things in short periods of time because we were under crunch, you know, I work at a consultancy in Omaha, and sometimes we get clients who are just like, okay, I have to get this done by March. And I'm like, it is November? Crap. But what happens is if you don't build in time after that crunch period, look, sometimes crunch happens, right? I'm not saying it doesn't. I mean, there's realities to the situation. But if you don't allocate time after that for the team to actually decompress, what happens is you're gonna hit that deadline and the team's gonna keep trucking at that pace and they will murder themselves. And they don't even understand why they're working like that. It's because that becomes the team norm. And those norms are invisible, usually, to the people inside of them, or often. So you as a manager have to be aware and ready to build that slack in. Build like rest sprints into your shit. Sorry. I, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> Create flexibility in scheduling and time off. This is one of the things that people have loved about working hybrid or working remote, is you have a lot more flexibility about being able to take care of children, being able to work in laundry, other household chores and tasks that used to be stressful to have to deal with because you had to work them into this weird nine to five schedule that was arbitrarily created you know, back in the days of the industrial revolution. Well, slightly after that with the unions, but I'm not gonna get into politics here. Point after, point is, you have the ability to make this available for your team in terms of flex time, in terms of allowing them days to go take care of things that would otherwise become stressors in their life. And that reduces their stress and that makes them less likely to get burnt out. Lastly, be on the, well, not lastly, but be on the look, alert for burnout, right? Just like other people, and as an individual, you can look at it in others. Be on the lookout for it in your team because it can creep up on you. And the faster you catch it in your folks, the faster and easier it is to deal with it. If you're catching them in those early stages, maybe it will just take a vacation for them to come back, to bounce back. Now, you're going to want to make some changes in how you're running things if you keep seeing people encountering that. But... If you catch it that early, it sometimes can be a lot easier to deal with it than, okay, now we have to make some major problems and this person's got to grapple with a bunch of personal and emotional issues that have come as a result of this. Because I guarantee you, if they're grappling with crippling anxiety and depression as a result of burnout, they're probably not doing the best work. You can also center the value that people provide. Focus on what it is they're bringing, both, you know, not just to the software they make, but to the company as a whole. Are they a light in dark times? They always make a joke on Slack. Do they remember people's birthdays? All of those things are things that they do as humans that helps build your culture as a company. Helps, you know, build that glue, that cohesion that makes you work as a team. And you can create an expectation that external stressors are to be talked about. Not just talking about them, but you can make it a part of, for instance, your sprint planning. I had a coworker towards the start of the pandemic. Um, his house burned down. Everyone in his family survived, including his pets, thankfully. But, you know, he probably didn't ship as many points the next couple of sprints. <laughs> Seems reasonable, right? It's not like you didn't know his house burned down. Just allocate for that. Maybe your team velocity is going to be a little lower. Oh, whine more. <laughs> because I guarantee you that making space to allow your employees, to allow the people on your team to be human, will make them infinitely more loyal to you. Because they found a place where they know they can actually thrive. 
And as a manager, you have to be the one to enforce those work-life boundaries. Maybe not with physical violence, <laughs> but at least if you threaten to take somebody and wheel them outside in their chair, like, go home. Because sometimes it is fun, right? A lot of us did get into this because we enjoy coding. And sometimes it's great to be like, yes, I'm having a great time. Go be with your family. Go be with your cats or whatever other pets you have. Boa constrictor, I don't know. <laughs> Managing those work-life boundaries in your employees becomes part of your job as a leader, as a team member, as a manager, as a, a CTO, as a CEO, whatever. But above all, everybody here, I want you to be alert, be aware, protect yourself from burnout. In the words of the great immortal Wu-Tang, protect your neck, right? <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for coming and listening to the talk. I hope you learned something. Um, I mentioned it at the beginning, but I tend to I stream all my talks on Twitch. So if you ever want to see what it takes to make one of these stupid things, uh, drop by and say hi. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.